me I can tell you that thank you brother Bruce what a blessing amen give him a round of applause thank you ah yes the music of heaven what a blessing you know David play he made all sorts of instruments amen all right let's go to the book of Ezekiel Ezekiel chapter 1 I said to Brother Zach, I might get, out, get kicked out of the Baptist Association. <laughs> but that's all right, amen. <laughs> there was no percussion in it. There was just, was it bass and bluegrass? Bluegrass is, bluegrass is just basically stringed, isn't it? Yeah, it's all acoustic. They're all acoustic, all acoustic, yeah. So even the bass there would have been a big double bass. The convention song, though, I think had a bit of percussion in it, which is okay with me. It's fine. Little, it's good. Little, Just a little. little, little Very tasteful, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, your goodness to us. Thank you for Brother Bruce in ministering to us in song and what a blessing that was and what well, was so good. It just really encouraged our spirits and we thank you for that. But Lord, now as we uh, come to your word, to preach your word, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would just uh, have your will and way and Lord, again, that we would just leave the house of God rejoicing, uh, knowing that we've had the opportunity to worship and to praise you, but also, Lord, to hear from you. And so I pray, Lord, that I don't get in the way this morning. I, I don't want to uh, be a hindrance or a stumbling block, but I do pray that you would use me to be an encouragement today. Fill me with your spirit. Fill us all with your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of us here... I would say, are familiar with uh, fire, fires, all right? especially in the country in which we live. 
Um, you know, we live in a country that has just got big extremes, and I'm not talking about the climate change stuff that's going on today, but most of us that have lived in Australia long enough to know that we've had, you know, extreme heat waves and we've had floods and we've had all sorts, but we've also had bushfires, and we know the devastation that bushfires can have, and um, I remember as a kid, uh, Ash Wednesday back in there in Adelaide in the hills there, and our teacher was a... Uh, uh, a country fire uh, guy, he was a, a volunteer and, and he took off and you could see the smoke and houses that were lost, livestock that was lost. So, you know, as a, as a country, we're not, we're not immune uh, to seeing those things. Even here in Queensland, we have burn-offs, right? During the cooler months, we, we see that the fire brigade are out just burning off all the bush and the undergrowth ready for the wet season. And so fire, fire is a good thing, but fire can be a devastating thing as well. And for those of you who like to go out camping, anyone like to go out camping? I like glamping. You know what glamping is now? Yeah, I think that's the way to go, that five-star hotel with everything that's there. That's what I like. But some of you like to rough it a little bit, you know, and you cook a fire, you start up a fire and you get that thing going and you cook on an open fire. And isn't it mesmerising when you just sit around the fire and you stare into it and the sparks and everything? It's just a, a wonderful thing. You know, to have. I remember as a kid, we used to help our neighbours out with shearing time. They had about 30,000 sheep uh, on their property and we'd go over and help them out. And um, uh, the, the men's quarters or the shearers' quarters that we would sleep in had, of course, they had toilets and showers. But if you wanted hot water, we had to go out down an old fence line and take the posts, the old fence posts, and we would have to chop them up and put them under the boiler the, with the water and I'd have to start the fire going. And that's the way that back in when I was a teenager on that property, we could have hot water. Because I don't know about you, I hate cold showers. So, you know, you have to put a bit of effort in. And, and not too long ago, there was a generation of people, that's what they had to do all the time. Uh, they had to go and cut the wood and all of that. Now we've just got to press a button and there's instant flame and, and all sorts now. But back in the day, they used to have to work hard to get those, uh, those fires going. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, I don't know whether Zach would identify with this or even Robert. But back in the day, there was a, um, a Marvel comic started called The Fantastic Four. And that actually began back in 1961. Anyone remember The Fantastic Four and you had those four guys? Well, one of them's name was Johnny Storm. And he was the human torch. And uh, whatever he touched and whatever he looked at, or if he didn't have his glasses on, everything would burn up and so on and so forth. And so when it comes to fire, whether it's uh, in entertainment or camping or, or something used for good or unfortunately something that happens that's really bad, all of us know about fire and the product of what a fire can produce. Well, if there's one thing that you know about the book of Ezekiel, you would know that Ezekiel had some very strange visions. And uh, from chapter 1, you just, you just jump straight on into it, these visions that Ezekiel have while he's in captivity with the rest of them. He gets these visions and, and God shows him a number of different things. He, uh, he shows him this, this first thing that he sees is this infolding fire just swirling around, uh, coming towards him, seeing it there. And, and then amongst all of that were these four beasts that he saw and faces of an eagle and a man and, and all of that sort of thing. And... Uh, the, other, the other vision that he had was the vision of the wheels and they had eyes all the way around it and, uh, you know, which, which pictures that wherever God was, they always had their focus on the Lord. And of course, out of all of this was dealing with God himself and his glory and his magnificence and his brilliance. But some really strange visions that Ezekiel would have. And I wouldn't recommend that we pray, God, give me a vision like that, because I reckon it would be very fearful. As a matter of fact, the visions that he had caused him to fall down and worship God. They were so, so terrible, if you please, in his sight. But I was reading through Ezekiel chapter 1 the other day, and there was something that just really captivated my, my heart. And I want you to look at verse number 26. It says this, and it says, And above the firmament, so he's carrying on with these visions that he's having, above the firmament there was, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. We all know who that is, don't we? All right, that appearance of the throne, John in, in John and other places, we see that they had Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. They have this vision of the throne. And, of course, the man that is sitting on the throne is who? It would be the Lord Jesus, right? Jesus is sitting on his throne. 
Verse number 27, he says, And I saw as the colour of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. What a vision. What I love about that is that this man that is on fire, this man that's on fire being the Lord Jesus Christ, what a, what a depiction, what a, a view that we get of what the Lord Jesus looks like, this appearance that he has. And what really got me about that is that here we've got this man of fire, this, the Lord Jesus Christ upon his throne. And I thought to myself, when I received Jesus as my saviour, I received this man. Do you know that when you got saved and you received the Lord Jesus Christ, the depiction that we have here is someone who is on fire. And when you got saved, the, this man of fire that was sent into your heart set you on fire. I love that old song, set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Burn it deep within me. I love that song. And so when I got saved, when I was reading this, I thought, you know what? When I got saved, I was set on fire. Do you remember? And I shared a little bit about this. When I got saved when I was 10, I mean, I didn't know anything else. You know, it's like it's 10 years old. And, but I knew that when I got saved, there just seemed to be this newness, this, this, this desire, this, this wanting. That I was just so, what we would say back in the day, on fire for God. I mean, I couldn't get enough. I didn't understand. I was 10. I couldn't understand everything. That, even today, I struggle to understand a, a lot of stuff that's in the Bible. But I knew, even though I didn't understand it, I, I had this unsatiable desire, this hunger to read the Word of God. And I wanted to be in church. And we were kids at the time, and I, whatever. I mean, my parents and my grandparents, who, we wouldn't let us go to church on a Sunday night. They would all go off. And, of course, my granddad, who wasn't saved, he would stay and look after us until I sort of made enough noise. And I said, how come we can't go to church on Sunday night with everybody else? And that was just the way it was. I just wanted to be in the house of God with God's people. I took, I, I took my Bible to school, and it wasn't just a little soul in his New Testament. I went to a state school. I took a big Bible. I didn't know any I would take a big Bible to school, and I would sit and I would read. It and, and I would talk to my friends about the Lord and I would invite my friends to come to church and some of my friends got saved. Why? Because I was on fire. But I want to ask the question this morning, and this is the message. In your life, is the fire still raging? Is the fire still raging? Now, we said we don't lose our salvation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. But you know that the fire can be quenched. You know, the fire, this, this man of fire that was sent into our hearts, this, this depiction that we have, this glory of the Lord that was sent into our hearts, are we still as on fire the day that we got saved? Or has it sort of dwindled and, and, and sort of died down a little bit? Every now and again it sparks up, but then it dies back down again. And, and, and what we need to do is we need to add some fuel to this fire to keep us burning for God. I don't care the day that we live in. I don't care what's going on with governments around the world. Everything that is taking place has not taken God by surprise. He's, he, know what, he knows what's going on. But it should not change the way that we serve the Lord one bit. You see, Romans 12 tells us we should serve God. It says, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. When I think about this vision that, that he has, this glory of the Lord, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, John Wesley, the old-time Methodist preacher, said this, God sets me on fire and people come and watch me burn. Of course, he was talking metaphorically, of course, but he knew about the fire of God that just burned deep within his soul. And no doubt the fire of God burned. I mean, you, took it, you look at the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ here. How can we not still be on fire for Jesus? But as I said, there are times where it is quenched. John the Baptist said this in 
In Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, he was baptizing in water and John the Baptist said, there comes one that's mighty and I, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand and he will purge thoroughly his floor. Now there's a bit of conjecture about all of that and whether we've got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and all sorts and, and there's a lot of experts out there that have, of course got all their ducks in a row and, and all of that. But I, I don't know how to best explain it, but I tell you what I do want. I, I want. I want that baptism or that fullness of the Holy Ghost and I want the fire to go along with it. Yep. Now some say, oh, that fire is a purifying fire. Well, if it is, so be it. So be it. And there's no doubt that there's some truth to that. But Jesus, how is it that Jesus can baptize with the Holy Ghost with fire? Because he is the man of fire that we talk about in Ezekiel chapter 1. And so he wants to set us on fire. Talks about the glory of the Lord here in verse number 28 towards the end there, this appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard the voice of one that spake. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I want to show you that you have this glory in you. You have the glory in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6 said, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light, or can I put it this way, to reveal, to bring revelation of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So you know what God is saying? He's saying, I want to reveal to you my glory, and you see the glory of God in the image of Jesus Christ. So when you see Jesus in the Gospels or throughout the Scriptures, what you get to see is the glory of God. Look at verse number 7. He says, but we have this treasure... The glory. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So the glory that we read of in Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel sees the appearance, the likeness of a man whose loins upwards and loins downwards is the appearance of fire, and he talks about the glory of the Lord. I want to tell you this morning that that glory is inside every one of us. But is the fire still raging? Is it still burning? Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 6, he says, stir up the gift. Stir up, which means to rekindle. Now, those of us and you who have actually been out camping, you know that there are times where you've got to poke the fire, you've got to stir the fire, you've got to get the embers going and you get that glowing again and you put more stuff on and you, you get that fire. That's what he's talking about, to stir up, to rekindle the flame. Yeah, you know, when you think about that term, rekindling the flame, it's often talked about in a uh, loving relationship. We need to just rekindle that flame. Well, whether it's a loving relationship between in families or whether it's with the Lord Jesus Christ or, or whether it's towards the family of God, you know, there are times, brethren, where you and I have to stir it up to rekindle that flame. In Luke chapter 24 and verse number 32, the two that were on the road to Emmaus, and what a, what a story that is. I mean, they didn't even know that it was Jesus that was with them and they're just chatting away and just real down about what was taking place and Jesus starts talking to them and expounds the scriptures and lets them know what's taking place. And these two men said this, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us along the way? As he opened unto us the scriptures, did not our hearts burn within us? Can I ask you the question this morning, is your heart still burning within you? Is the fire still raging this morning? In Psalm 104 and verse number 4, God talks about his ministers as a flame of fire. You know what we need in pulpits across Australia today? We need some ministers who are on fire for God. We need some fire from the pulpit. And yet today everyone wants to get up and just give a little story and a little talk and a little this and a little that. And we don't want to upset. We don't want to, uh, you know, all this. Hey, I don't want to tell you something. We need some fire in the pulpit today. There's some fire. Why? Because if there's no fire, if there's ice in the pulpit, there's going to be ice in the pew. There's going to be a coldness about the church. And what we need is we need some men and, and we need ladies in the church that are just on fire for God. We get on fire and stirred up about every other thing known to mankind, but what about the things of God? Are we stirred up? Oh, so I love that singing. I love hearing those songs. You know why I love that sort of song? It stirs me right up. It gets me fired up and shouting and hallelujah and whoop, you know, all that sort of stuff. I love it. 
Don't you dare bring in the wet blanket brigade and try and put that out. <laughs> All right? We need more of that in churches. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit. Hebrews 13.29, our God is a consuming fire. You know the thing about God's consuming fire, you think about the burning bush, the bush was burning but it was still there, right? So when it's talking about the consuming fire, I don't know about you, I want to be consumed with the fire. Not to be burnt up because that's not what he wants to do to me. He may want to burn some of the rubbish that's in my life and he's, he's welcome to it, amen? But I want to be so consumed with the fire of God. And you and I can be consumed with the fire of God because the man that was on fire in Ezekiel chapter 1, you received into your heart. But is the fire still raging? Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 23 and verse 29, Is not my word like as a fire? In Revelation 11 and verse number 5, there were two witnesses, two prophets, and I was talking to some of the men yesterday about this, and, and uh, they came on the scene, and if anyone tried to hurt these two prophets, the Bible says that fire come out of their mouth. And people were killed that way if they tried to harm them, and when God had finished with them, then, then they killed them, and they killed them because they troubled the earth. They troubled the people that was on the earth. We need some prophets of God today that will just trouble some people. I'm serious. Trouble us and get, it out, get us out of our status quo and get us out of our ho-hum life and set us on fire again. Let's have a look at Isaiah 64. Just go with me to the book of Isaiah 64. We often say in a way that we want God to come down and, and I know what we mean by that. We don't mean that we want to see a physical vision of Jesus but we just want God to invade our services, don't we? Amen. Thank you, Ruth. We want God to invade our services. We want God here today, don't we? It's not, it's not so much about man. We fellowship and we hear good singing and we're ministered to in song, but it's about Jesus today. This is the Lord's day. It's still the Lord's day. And it should all be about Jesus. And unfortunately today it can be anything but, even amongst brethren today. Isaiah 64 and verse 1. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. I love that those two verses because they're almost like revivalistic kind of verses. Oh, we want God to come down, but do we want... God to bring with him what he wants to bring. Oh, God, come down. But hey, if God showed up in such a way, you know what would happen for all of us? We'd just all fall prostrate on our faces because God is here. Where is the humility today? Where is the worship today? Where is the, the humbling before the, the feet of God today? He's still God, even though he's my heavenly father. And notice what these waters or this fire does. It's called the melting fire. The melting fire. Why? Well, because there was some people that were just like ice blocks. The chosen frozen. <laughs> Have you seen them? Have you been around them? The frozen believers that don't crack a smile. And, and they're so pious and spiritual, they look so miserable that you don't want a bar of it. And I, I don't know about you, I hate being cold. I don't mind the heat. I love, I'm looking forward to summer. I love the humidity. It's the one thing that I rejoiced in when I left Adelaide, that cold, cold place. It was like an ice block. We moved to Queensland. I thought, man, this is so different. This is so good. And I'm sure Tracy wants me committed. <laughs> Have my head red. But I hate the cold. I remember when we left the Sunshine Coast in 2013 and took a church over in Perth. The first winter, I thought I was going to die. I thought my toes were going to fall off. They were that frozen. I don't like being cold, do you? No. no I don't like being around cold people. No. <laughs> we need some melting fire. Because sometimes we do get cold to the things of God. Sometimes we, we are like those ice blocks and we need God to send the fire that would cause the waters to boil. Do you know there are times in the Bible where the, the word waters are a metaphor for people? 
And when you look at this, when you think about the mountains, he's talking about major nations that he's dealing with. And, and who knows that, that when Jesus Christ does come back and he sets up his millennial reign, who knows that there is going to be some humbling before him? I mean, we as Christians today, we look at the world and we hear the world and we look at how they are are disgraceful towards the things of God and they're so blasphemous towards the things of God. you just got to remind yourself their day is coming. Their day is coming. It's their day now. It's their time now. And Jesus said that, that this is your hour, Satan, and the the power of of, of Satan. It's his time right now. But there's going to come a time where Jesus will take over. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's not going to put up with any rubbish. He's going to deal swiftly. So we may lament now. We may be upset about things now. But we ought to rejoice because there is a day coming. But even though the day is bad and even though the day is cold towards the things of God, we don't need to be frozen along with it. We need to be set on fire. And I'm asking this morning, is the fire still raging within you? When I think about the fire, you know, you think about stuff and... You know that fire burns the rubbish. We know that the Aboriginal people would set the fires and they would burn all that stuff off. And and some might think, well, why do they do that? Because it gets rid of all the rubbish and it stimulates new growth. It brings new life. And so when John says that there was going to be someone, that is Jesus, who was going to baptise with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hands. And when you're on fire, guess what he's going to do? He wants to fan the flames. Because he wants to burn up the rubbish in our life. He wants to burn up the dross and he wants to bring forth new life and blessing. No wonder we ought to be a people who are on fire. We ought to welcome that. I'm not talking about the fires of hell. I've been delivered from that. But I want to be set on fire of God. And I want to approach this life as someone who is on fire for God. As I said, fire melts the cold, frozen Christian, making them boil. I asked the question this morning, have you gone off the boil? Have you gone off the boil with some things? Oh, you're in in church this morning? Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. It's good to have you. It's good to have some folks visiting. What a blessing. But you know, I used to be in church and as cold as all get out. Just going through the motions. I'm not saying that's you. I'm talking about me, unfortunately, when I was a teenager. Got to go to church. Well, that's what we do. We go to church and we sit there and songs are being sung and we're teenage boys looking around and mucking around and all sorts. And we, well, we used to get into some strife. So just because we're in church today doesn't mean we're on the boil. We can still be in church and off the boil. You know, talk about witnessing, send the light, send the light. You know, the main goal of the church of Jesus Christ is to be a witness. That's the main thing. And I've said this before. If we as a church, if the only thing that we did was have services and witness, God would be happy with that because that's what the church is all about. Today, we've got to have all sorts. It's almost we've got to fill up everybody's calendar by being in church Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and, and all of that. And I'm not again, I was brought up with that sort of stuff and, and uh, you know, whatever. But, you know, who here understands that life's busy? I mean, life's pretty busy, right? And, uh, you know, I'm sure that there would be some of you if you said, right, we're going to have services every night. There would be some that would come here, but I don't know how excited you would be, but you would come because you want to support and all that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? But, hey, if the only thing we did as a church was have a Sunday service and went out and told people about Jesus, that's all that needs doing. It really is. It really is. Who knows that the fire will go out if left unattended? Won't it? gone camping or whatever it is and you go to bed, you go into your tent or into your swag or whatever it is and you go to bed with the fire crackling away there and going really good and you get up in the morning and what's the first thing you've got to do? You've got to stoke that thing up, get it going. Why? We want to cook on the fire, we want to boil the billy, we want to do all those sorts of things but overnight when it's left unattended it goes out. Same with your life. Same with your life, same with my life. If there are things that are unattended in my life, the fire goes out. The fire goes out. The fire has the propensity to affect others. I love being around people that are on fire. I love being around people that 
that have just got this attitude of, man, we can do it and all that. I love being around. I need to be around people like that, don't you? I don't want to sit with the wet blanket brigade. Some people think that quenching the fire is their spiritual gift. You can have it. I don't want it. I want someone that's got some petrol. Pour it on me, baby, and set me on fire. You know what I mean? Like, don't you want to be on fire for God? I want to be on fire for God. I want the fire to be raging. I've been saved since 1980. It's been a while now, and I still want the fire to burn. I don't want it to go out. I don't want it to smoulder. I don't want it just to have the embers dying and, and all sorts and wishing every day away. Oh, Jesus, come back today. He was, he's going to come back when he's ready, right? Oh, I'm having such a hard time. I've got a bad back. Jesus, come back. I was saying to Brother Michael, I think, I'm getting old. I didn't think I would have a hard time with getting old, but I think I've got sciatica problems. Who's ever had sciatica problems before? All right, let's all come up and be healed. Amen. <laughs> come on, Benny. <laughs> and it's like, oh, the back down. You know what it's like, those of you that have had it. It's like, oh, man. And it's like, some t- I got out of my chair the other day. I kid you not. I got out of my, my recliner the other day, and I'm like, oh. I'm like that. It's like, I'm 54 years old and I'm walking around like this. Oh, Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> if the fire is not raging, if you're not on fire, if you've gone off the boil, what do we do? What do we do? I want to go to Romans chapter 12. Let's go to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. Romans chapter 12. And also... I want you to pick up First Corinthians, uh, sorry, First Kings, nineteen. All right, can you do that? First Kings nineteen. Ah, oh, sorry, First Kings eighteen. We'll go to First Kings eighteen. What do we do? All right, let's go to Romans chapter twelve, verse number one. Paul says this: "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, would you read the next phrase with me?" That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That he's saying, brethren, that I want you to place yourself as a sacrifice on the altar of God. Now we know that in the Old Testament there were different kinds of sacrifices. And one of those sacrifices was known as the burnt sacrifice, the burnt offering where the offering, the sacrifice, would be put on fire. I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings 18, and we see here a showdown between Baal's prophets and Elijah. I love Elijah's sarcasm. I identify with Elijah's sarcasm. Maybe a little too much. Yes? yes? Descent in the pew? The only time you get an amen is when it's like, I've got problems. Yes. (laughs) We know the account. I'm sure of it. You know, they do their thing. And Elijah's like, where's your God? Has he gone on a holiday? Perhaps he's gone to sleep. Elijah gives the word that you build up the old altar, which is a really good thought right there. They built up again the old altar. They they put all the wood on it. They made a, 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 a moat around it. They got all the water. They poured it over the sacrifice, it filled up everything. There was just It was drenched. I mean, in reality, it shouldn't catch fire, right? Verse number 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You notice when the fire fell, it just didn't consume the sacrifice. Everything around it, including the dirt, it all got licked up. You say, what are you saying? In Romans 12, he says that you and I present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We put ourselves on the altar of God's sacrifice. And when we do that, I'm praying that the fire would fall. Because I want the fire to burn. I want it to rage. Don't you? 
Don't you want to be on fire for God? So the way, a way that we want to regain that fire is that we present ourselves as a living sacrifice and pray that the fire of God would just come down and set us on fire again. That's what we need, amen? Secondly, let the word of God set you on fire. You remember Jeremiah, God says to Jeremiah, is not my word as a fire? Didn't the two on the road to Emmaus say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us along the way? May God help us the next time in our personal Bible reading time, and I do hope and pray that you have one. I hope you're never so busy that you don't avail yourself to the word of God. But whether it's reading the word of God, we want God to set us on fire. We want to be excited about the things of God that's in this book because this is a living book. I don't ever as a church want to do away with the Bible and let's put all the verses on the screen. That's not what I want. Do you know why? Because doing that, people don't know where to go to in the Bible. They don't know how to navigate the scriptures anymore because they're not in it. They can just press a button or they can do whatever. And, and I know I get modern technology. I get that. But I still love the written word. I still love the Bible that's covered in leather and all of that and, and I get to read it and I highlight it and, and uh, you know, I, I change Bibles when I've got no more space to write anything and, and it's just a, it's amazing to me. It blesses my heart. And I get the fact that there are times when it's dry when you read the scriptures. Oh no, I'm in Leviticus again. You know what I mean? I'm going through something that's dry. Do you know, when you think about Australia and how dry we get, that it only takes a spark to set something on fire? You know, I'll be honest. Can I be honest without people saying amen again? <laughs> Do you know I've gone to passages in the Bible, say like Leviticus, and I've thought, I might just skip over that. Have you ever done that before? I might just skip over that. Confession's good for the soul. But I know now, by now, in my, that how old I am in the Lord, I know that if I did that, I would miss out on something. And without doubt, there was a passage of Scripture that I just didn't want to read because it's, it's this one beget that, and this one begot that, and all the chronology, and all this sort of stuff. I'm like, why is that there? It's there for a reason. And believe it or not, you can get something good out of the genealogies in the Bible. For example, in the Lord's genealogy, guess who's in his genealogy? A harlot. A prostitute. Rahab. Who had her dwelling up on the roofs of Jericho, because Jericho was really wide. She had her tent up there. She had the red light glowing. Everybody knew that she was there. They would look up, yep, Rahab's in business. Woo, let's go, you know what I mean? And off they went. And you know what? She's in the Lord's genealogies. Who would have thought? There's probably some people in our own genealogies we wish they just weren't there, right? <laughs> but with the Lord, Rahab was there. So there's something in the scriptures for everybody. And the day that you just say, I'm reading it, it's like, oh, I've read this a million times before. I know what it says. It could be that time that you read it and God just gives you something fresh and sparks something in you. And off you go, raging with fire, burning for the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's reading on a mentioned preaching. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us along the way? I'm looking forward to hearing Jesus speak in person. Aren't you? I'm looking forward just to hearing his voice. I get the fact that I can hear him through the scriptures. I've got the spirit within me. But how many of us know that sometimes we get confused? Is that you, God? Or is that me? Or is it the world? Is it the enemy? And we've got this confusion that goes on. But one day, there's not going to be any confusion. We're going to hear him speak. But brethren, we can hear him speak now. It's why preaching is so important in our day. I said preaching, not giving a little talk, not a little TED talk, not a, let's, have a, let's have a little talk with Jesus. You know what I mean? I, love that. I do love that song. I wish you'd sung it. I was almost tempted. <laughs> not over yet. Day is not over yet. But we do need some, we need some fiery preachers today. We need preachers that are set on fire of God. Lastly, rekindle the flame yourself. As Paul said to Timothy, stir it up. Stir it up. I can only do so much. I, I stir people naturally. <laughs> I, that's a spiritual gift in, 
in First Maccabees. <laughs> He's got it right there. <laughs> it's called exhortation, if you want to put a biblical word to it. But you know I can only do so much as a preacher. You've got to take some responsibility yourself and go home and stir up. Stir it up. Rekindle it. Poke and prod. I'm, I can poke and prod, but you're going to leave soon. You're going to go home. You're going to probably forget the message and, and so on and get on with life. But you know what? Never forget that the man that was on fire in the book of Ezekiel chapter 1 is the one that you received as your saviour. And that fire that you received set you on fire. Set your soul, set your spirit, however you want to say it. And you got on fire for God. But over the course of time, it was quenched. We know sin quenches the fire. We know that. Sin is not a popular thing to speak about today. And I know you put something up there. You know, we want to call it everything else but sin. You know what I mean? And it, people say, oh, I made a mistake. No, you sinned. Sin is a biblical term. But we don't like to use that. But sin does quench the fire. Do you know the problems of our day? If we get so wrapped up in what's happening in the world today, we get discouraged. And discouragement can quench the fire. That's why I don't watch. I'm not ignorant of what's going on, but I don't watch a lot of news. I don't, I'm not always on whatever you call it, TikTok or whatever it is, because it's like it's depressing. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be oppressed. I don't want to be quenched. I want the fire to burn. So I've got to avail my... That's why I go to... And I'm not saying you've got to do this. I do. I go to sleep listening to preaching. I have some favourite preachers that I like to listen to. I've got to turn it down a little bit, otherwise I'd never go to sleep. But I go to sleep hearing these guys just preaching. I love it. I love it. So stir it up. Stir up the gift that God has given you. The, that spiritual gift. We've got to stir it up. Is the fire still raging? Are you still on the boil or are you off the boil? In what area of your life is the fire no longer burning? Is it something to do with the Lord? Is it something to do in an earthly relationship that, you know, this is why, you know, you talk about, I don't know, this time, you know, when you've been married a long time, you know, you get used to each other and expectations and all of this, but you... <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> oh, wow, someone give us some counselling. <laughs> but you do, the longer that you're with someone, it can, you know, you've got to rekindle it. You've got to spark it up again, you know what I mean? By doing something in the relationship. Don't let it fizzle out, whether it's your husband or your wife, whether it's your kids or whether it's the Lord, rekindle it. So I hope the fire rate is raging in your heart today. And I hope you're on fire for the things of God. You say, I am on fire. Good, then tuck this away somewhere. Because there's always going to be a day where the wet blanket crowd will come and they've got the bucket and they say, you're too on fire for God. You're convicting. And want to douse it. Don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, I just do pray right now. Lord, as we have this moment of prayer, Lord, that you would search our hearts. Lord, if there is an area in our life that is not on fire, if there is an area in our life that we've gone off the boil, then I pray that the melting fire would be sent and that the waters would begin to boil again and that we would be on fire for our God. This world needs Christians on fire. And I pray in our little congregation that you would set our soul on fire for Jesus again. We ask this in your precious name. Amen.